Happy New Year and cheers to 2024. I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to another edition of Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas filled with family and friends and you had some good food and you get your gifts and everything. Uh, let me know what are your New Year's resolutions. If you have any, just write it in the comments below. We have an amazing show lined up for you tonight, but it's going to be a little different. It's actually our Taking Stock Year in Review. We're bringing you the top five business stories of 2023 because let's be real, 2023 was quite the year, wasn't it? And the analysts will also tell you their top picks for 2024, and they'll also give you last year's highlights for them. Now, you know the drill. Join the Money Mission community today. This weekend, I'll be hosting my in-person Build Your Budget workshop, and we'll be planning our entire financial year. Not just companies can have financial year. We have one too. So click the link in the description or the comments to join. And remember to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Now, come on, let's get this money happy new year it's our annual year in review we'll recap the top stories of 2023 that had us sitting at the edge of our seats and the analysts will have their topics for 2024 and they'll tell us what was their highlight of 2023 If you're about to start 2024 broke, listen carefully. You need a plan. Your debt may seem insurmountable and your income too small, but you can do it just like Anita. I had quite a number of debt from that master's program and Kalila came to my organization. We had a session where she introduced us to how to budget, how to manage our money and also how to invest. And through the tools that she gave us on that day, the tools and the templates that she provided me, I was able to set up my budget, organize my life, all my income streams, what my credit card debts are like and how to manage that. And I was able to get out of debt by March the following year. So I took approximately five months and this was something I was struggling with for maybe about a year and with Kalila's help through the money mission I was able to get through that. Join me on January 13 for my in-person build your budget workshop. We're going to plan out the whole of 2024. I promise you that if you stick to the plan your life will be dramatically better at the end of 2024. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Suspensions, resignations, receivership. 2023 was a roller coaster year for iCreate, our number five story of the year. 2023 started off looking pretty promising for digital media company iCreate. They were coming off a massive capital raise that would be used to fund some new acquisitions. This was expected to change the company's trajectory and boost its financials. Additionally, because of their rapid growth, they were also planning a move to the big boys table on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Accurate founder and CEO Tyron Wilson appeared on Taking Stock in February. Accurate, in, you know, as we know, we have exceeded the capital um, the maximum amount we can raise on the junior market, right? Um, as a result of that, the art almost automatic thing to do is to seek to move to the main market. Um, as it is now, based on the rules, we are, you know, quote and unquote in, uh, I wouldn't say violation or so, it's a strong word, but we're not within the guidelines of what the rules stipulate. Um, so I create migrating to the main market needs to happen like very soon. So our, our team, our corporate secretary, Dimitri Adams, um, our team, we, we're, we've made the necessary communication to the stock exchange. We're working on the application, putting together the, the necessary board, um, 
resolutions and so forth to to move that process along but we think we'll be will be there within the month of February this month. Well, it's been almost a year since that interview, and things haven't gone as planned. In June, an anonymous group called JSC Investors United sent a letter to the media and the JSC accusing Wilson and Accurate of several things, which, for legal reasons, we won't repeat here. The group also accused the JSC and the industry's regulator, the Financial Services Commission, of poor oversight and allowing accurate to mislead investors. Wilson quickly denied the allegations, calling them false and hurtful. He said as a publicly listed company on a highly regulated exchange, accurate would not be allowed to go rogue. However, the letter did bring attention to the fact that several of accurate's financial statements and reports had been delayed for an extended period. At that point in June, the company's second quarter report, which was due on March 30, had already been delayed. Additionally, the annual report, which should have been submitted by April 30, was also delayed. According to the company, the acquisition of outdoor advertising company Visual Vibes was responsible for the holdup. But then in August, the company delayed the publication of the results again. That may have been the final straw for the JSC, which suspended iCreate from trading. Wilson then announced his decision to step down as CEO and director. The JSC said the company would remain suspended until the financial reports were published. iCreate gave themselves a month and a half to get everything sorted. But that was still only the start of the saga. The month-long suspension was extended because they didn't have a mentor as per junior market rules. Agrid finally published their results on September 29 and appointed Kalanda Hutchinson as mentor. They finally resumed trading on October 10. Speaking on taking stock, interim CEO Arlene Martin said that the company had a plan to turn things around. There is stability and there is growth. And stability and growth based on things that have been happening when you have new leadership and just settling everyone into place but stability in terms of the operations corporate governance and a number of things like that and then focused on growth not only because of the opportunities that are out there in all of the segments but also the potential that's in the company the focus on growth and stability also come from the recent acquisitions so in january 2022 we would have closed the acquisition of get paid group limited that does sms communication as well as e-commerce and we would have announced in 2022 the acquisition of visualvibe.com which is a digital out of home advertising company that closed fully um, earlier this year, um, end of May 2023. So you'd have seen that we started reporting and including as a group the um, financials for Visual Vibe beginning in, and we also synchronized that we had the Q2 um, results. That was the period ending June 23 published. We'd have seen one month re reflected for Visual Vibe then, and then in Q3, would have seen that visual vibe was um, fully represented. But just days after that interview at the company's AGM, Wilson mounted a surprise comeback, using this majority stake through his other companies, Kintyre Holdings and eMedia Interactive, to re-elect himself as CEO of iCreate. At the same time, Martin was removed as interim CEO and company director. Ricardo Allen, Dania Joy Wint and Ivan Carter were also booted as company directors and Crichton Mullings and Associates was removed as the company's auditors. Wilson said his comeback was a positive step for the company and they'd get back to work. Then shortly after his return, Wilson announced that iCreate had sold a 30% stake in Visual Vibes to an investment group led by businessman Anthony Dunn. But in yet another turn of events, iCreate was placed in receivership on December 18. Sagico Investments essentially took over control and management of the company as per the terms of a bond contract in 2020. The agreement gave Sagico Investments, which arranged the bond, the right to assume control if iCreate failed to meet its payment obligations. According to a statement from Sagico, receivership was not their first option. The trustee and bondholder were reportedly in consistent extended dialogue with iCreate management, but they weren't able to recover the full outstanding balance. Sajikor said it is their responsibility to ensure their client is paid. Kenneth Tomlinson, who was previously appointed receiver at SSL, has also been appointed receiver at iCreate. Now on to number four. 2023 will go down as one of the most difficult years in Beryllium's history. 
thieves executed a string of daring robbery attempts that left one person dead, several injured, and many more scared. It also plunged Jamaica's ATM system into chaos. Getting money from the ATM has become an Olympic sport for most people, following several attacks on Beryllium security teams. Beryllium is the main security and transport company for financial institutions. Its security teams came under heavy fire in 2023, literally. In February, thieves attacked one of the company's security teams while they were out servicing a JN bank in Portmore. A guard was killed during the heist and the robbers reportedly made off with $10 million. Then a few weeks later, robbers struck again, this time at a Scotiabank location just a feet away from the first robbery. Thankfully, no one died, but all four members of the security team were shot. The robbers stole 27 million Jamaican dollars. That's about 175,000 USD. Since then, copycat robbers have attacked beryllium teams across the island almost every month. Speaking on taking stock, beryllium president Andre McLean said the attacks took a massive toll on the company's morale. I'll tell you what, what caused me probably the, the biggest stress over the last year, and it is looking at my fellow colleagues who strap on a bulletproof vest and say to them, yes, we know there are guns, we know there are issues out there. Okay, let's go to work now, right? And that's not our demeanor. We really value our team members and knowing the type of risks, talking to them even after a shooting, after a killing, to have that type of staff meeting and to be resilient and get back out there to convince them. We have a lot of goodwill, you know, as a leadership team and the people believe in us and believe that we, we are going to do what we say to protect them and safeguard them. Because at the end of the day, everybody just simply wants to just earn their bread simply. We want to be facing gunfire and the ridicule of the public, which has been another challenge where TikTok became, we became TikTok famous not for good things. You know, Jamaica took our situation and we said we laugh at everything, but these were lives, these were individuals who have to go home to their families and wander and serve the public constantly. So that type of ridicule was not very welcome. The spate of robberies tossed the ATM network into complete chaos. Each attack resulted in beryllium suspending or limiting their routes. This meant that ATMs ran dry for days at a time and customers were left without cash. The police have made several arrests, including a team from beryllium itself. McLean said the company is working with the police and the financial institutions to develop better and safer strategies for transporting cash. He added that technology will also play an essential role in their operations going forward. Use of technology is very important in managing our teams, having great communication, having the type of um, infrastructure that is required. And not just our technology, but even the investments in the public space, use of cameras, use of monitoring tools, using artificial intelligence. Those things are currently underway, um, implemented as well, but again, we can never have too much technology, but again, once we, make, once we make it very useful to us. Okay, so what do you think our number three story is? And can you guess number one? Write it in the comments below. We'll take a quick break and come back with your number three story. If you had 10 minutes with a billionaire, what advice would you ask? Billionaire Michael Leachin is coming back to Money Media for the next installment of Ask Mike, and you could be one of five people to get personal finance advice from him. Check out some of our previous mentees. You have to do both, Roberta. You have to work on the business and in the business. Borrowing to invest. Borrowing to invest. That has been pivotal to how I create, to how wealth is created. The link is in the description. Let's get this money. Welcome back. Let's head into our number three story of 2023. NCB and Michael Leachin were all over the news last year. After more than two years, NCB finally brought back dividend payments, but it was a rocky road to get there. Here's more. Coming into 2023, there had been a lot of noise around NCB's lack of dividend payments. Shareholders were upset, 
because a lot of them, especially pensioners, depend on NCB's regular dividends. But perhaps the most unhappy shareholder was NCB's chairman, Michael Lee Chin. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the Bank of Jamaica had suspended all dividend payments. Most blue-chip companies resumed regular dividends after the mandate was lifted a few months later. But not NCB. The stock's price tumbled from over $200 pre-COVID to $81 at the start of 2023. And it kept falling, dipping as low as $60. The declining stock price coupled with the lack of dividends and several multi-billion dollar fraud scandals involving employees caused investors to panic. Then in July, Lichin announced that he was stepping away from the company for three months to focus on other projects. And boy oh boy did that cause some drama. There were speculations about his health, something that Lichin addressed on taking stock. I'm 72, okay? And... Every year, I make sure that I can do my age in push-ups. Mm -hmm. So yesterday morning, I did 73, non-stop. Did I answer that, that question? You're eh? fit as a fiddle in great health. Exactly. But on top of that, Legion also sold his infamous mega yacht and his mansion in the Cayman Islands along with several other assets. That really got investors worried about NCB's future and wondering why he was selling. He also tried to clear that up on taking stock. You know, periodically you have to take stock. Uh, it's, it's like spring cleaning, right? Uh, you accumulate these things and then you say, hmm, uh, am I getting optimal use out of these assets? Right? Age and stage. What should I be doing? What, what should, how should I be allocating my capital today? But no matter how much Lee Chin tried to reassure investors, things just weren't getting better. So he eventually had to cut the sabbatical short and come back to NCB and take a more hands-on role in operations. And he hit the ground running. Several top execs across the NCB group announced their resignations, including longtime CEO Patrick Hilton and Deputy CEO Dennis Cohen. Their departure spurred a new months long dilemma because in 2021, Hilton and Cohen had reportedly given up nearly $14 billion worth of NCB shares. Now that they were leaving, it was time to collect. They eventually settled for around half that and are now reportedly among NCB's largest shareholders. The other resignations and appointments made way for what Legion said was a shift in the company's focus to ensure customer satisfaction above all else. And one of the best ways to satisfy customers, many of whom were shareholders, was by bringing back dividends. NCB declared its first dividend in over two years in November. Shareholders received their payouts on December 18. On to our number two story, Venezuela and Guyana have had a dispute over the Essequibo region since the 1800s, but it all came to a head in 2023 when Venezuela took more aggressive steps. The global oil and gas industry was estimated to be worth over four trillion US dollars last year. So, when there is a border dispute between two oil producing countries, things can get hot. Venezuela and Guyana have been feuding over a region called Essequibo for over a century. Venezuela argues that Essequibo, which makes up over two thirds of Guyana, should be part of Venezuela. Essequibo is extremely oil and mineral rich. An international treaty from 1899 gave Guyana sovereign rights over the region. But according to Venezuela, the tribunal that made the decision was rigged and Essequibo should belong to them. The back and forth has been going on for decades. Then Guyana hit oil in 2015. So far, more than 11 billion barrels of oil and gas have been discovered off Guyana's coast and oil companies are still exploring. Guyana's economic growth has skyrocketed. The country is expected to become one of the top five oil-producing countries in the world. Now Venezuela, which was already a major global oil producer, wants a piece of the pie, which they claim was always theirs to begin with. In 2018, Guyana asked the International Court of Justice to intervene and give a ruling on the dispute once and for all. The problem is, 
Venezuela argues that the ICJ doesn't have the right to decide on the issue. All of that led to December 3, 2023, when the Venezuelan government held a national referendum. They asked Venezuelans to vote on the creation of a new Venezuelan state that would include the Esequibo region. The resolution passed, and the Venezuelan government debuted a new map showing Esequibo as part of Venezuela. But of course, Guyana wasn't just going to take all of this line down. Guyana's government argued that the referendum was a move to annex part of their country, which they'd defend by whatever means necessary. It got so intense that at one point, Brazil started intensifying its military operations, just in case. Trying to avoid an all-out war in the region, several leaders across Latin America and the Caribbean organized a sit-down between the two countries. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and Guyanese President Irfan Ali met in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in December and agreed not to use force to settle the dispute. They said they were open to more dialogue. Now here is our top story. Do you know what it is? If you guessed Usain Bolt and SSL saga, you got it right. The Stocks and Securities Limited fraud is one of the biggest scandals to hit Jamaica in recent years. More than 200 customers were scammed of over 30 million US dollars in a fraud scheme that dates back decades. No doubt, this had to be our top number one spot. Here's a look back. The last thing any of us expected barely two weeks into the new year was news that over 12 million US dollars had been stolen from the investment account of hometown hero and sprint legend Usain Bolt. But those were the headlines that dominated local and international media for weeks after a multi-billion dollar fraud scandal was uncovered at one of Jamaica's oldest investment firms, Stocks and Securities Limited SSL. The news sent shockwaves across the island's financial sector severely eroding investor confidence, and the market has still not recovered. At the top of the year, former wealth advisor Jean Ann Panton reportedly gave a written confession admitting that she stole over 3 billion Jamaican dollars, or about 12 million US, from 40 of her clients, including Bold. According to one of the early statements from SSL, Panton originally omitted Bold's name from the list of clients she had reportedly stolen from. She then allegedly contacted Bolt's team herself in a bid to have them help her replace the missing money. But that backfired. The revelation, however, prompted a massive year-long investigation which uncovered, quote, an entrenched culture of gross mismanagement of client funds at the institution. The Financial Investigations Division enlisted the help of the United States Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, and Kroll, a forensic accounting firm from the United Kingdom. So far, over 30 million US dollars and some 200 client accounts have been affected in a web of fraud that dates back to at least 2006, 16 years ago. After a year of investigations, there have been a lot of twists and turns to this story. Bold and his team had originally given SSL a 10-day deadline to repay his stolen funds. However, they backed down to let the investigation unfold. At one point, the directors of the company reportedly tried to initiate moves to wind up the company before the investigation fully got going, but were blocked by the court. Later, SSL employees pulled a sick out because they hadn't been paid. The government announced that they'd use taxpayers' money to temporarily cover the company's expenses so that the investigation wouldn't be disrupted. That caused massive public uproar, leading the government to stress that the move was only temporary. However, it never ended up happening because some of SSL's tied-up funds got released just in time to pay the employees. There was also the time Jean Ann Panton, who is the only person arrested so far, claimed that she was enticed into confessing by SSL founder Hugh Crossgrey. Panton and her lawyers tried repeatedly to get her bail, citing her poor health. Videos surfaced online showing Panton in a wheelchair and using a walker. According to her bail applications, she suffered a stroke and several seizures while in custody. However, a doctor later testified that he had seen no signs of these claims. So yeah, lots of twists. The scandal also exposed inadequacy in some of the regulatory bodies. The Financial Services Commission, whose job it is to oversee investment firms, had given SSL numerous warnings dating back to 2010 to clean up their act or risk suspension. But after several warnings, nothing happened, 
and SSL was allowed to continue operating despite a pattern of failing to adhere to regulations. One disastrous press conference later, the government announced that it would be folding the FSC into the Bank of Jamaica, making the BOJ the ultimate regulatory authority over the investment banking industry. Now, the institutional arrangements and approach of the Financial Services Commission that I described <clears throat> over these past 13 years and probably before, and that have been highlighted by this particular case in question, cannot take us into the future. SSL founder Hugh Crosker resigned from his role as director early on in the investigation, and the FSC announced that they had dropped their case against him in December. According to the FID, more people are expected to be arrested in connection to the scandal. The decision on who gets arrested now rests with the director of public prosecutions. So did you guess right? Well, that one was probably obvious. I don't think anything could have topped SSL for the year, but I still want to hear from you. Take tonight's poll question on Twitter or on the community tab of YouTube. What was your top story for 2023? I create beryllium, NCB, Guyana, SSL, or do you think it was something else completely? Let me know in the comments. Up next, we've got your 2023 market recap, and the analysts will have their top picks for 2024. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Hey, moneymakers, join the KRM fam with our official merch. Get it now at KhalilaReynolds.com. Let's get this money. Market recap is brought to you by MyMoneyJA.com. Time now for your market recap for the year 2023. The JSE Combined Index fell 7% in 2023. The main market was down almost 8%. And the junior market fell almost 2%. 50 stocks made gains last year, while 78 lost value and 8 stayed the same. 8 billion shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market over the year, valued at $48 billion. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the year. JPS 7% was 2023's top stock. The stock soared a whopping 6,000% to close the year at $41.86. New leadership helped the former shell company Sibony finish the year as the market's second biggest gainer. The stock was up 98%, closing 2023 at $1.11. And 138 student living variable preference was up 95% to close the year at $114.47. On the losing side now, iCreate was 2023's biggest loser, down 70%. The stock closed the the year at 53 cents. Elite had the second biggest dip in 2023, down 47%, to close the year at $1.65. And First Rock Real Estate Investments, JMD, fell almost 46% to close the year at $7.67. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index fell 9% last year. Massey Holdings was the most traded stock. It closed the year at $4.38 TT. Endeavor Holdings was the market's biggest gain up 50% to end 2023 at $13.10 TT. The West Indian Tobacco Company fell 58%, closing at $8.90 TT. It was an overall good year for U.S. stocks. The Dow Jones was up almost 14%, while the S&P 500 gained almost 25%, and the Nasdaq was up 44%. The top stock in the U.S. last year was App Love Incorporation, up 325%. The company's main business is providing a platform for mobile app developers to market and grow their apps. It is listed on the Nasdaq. The worst U.S. stock was Novacure Limited, which fell 84%. The company develops and markets devices that create tumor-treating fields that disrupt cancer cell division. At the pumps, gas prices went up last year, with 87 gaining $5.04 and 90 gaining $7.17. Diesel prices, on the other hand, saw a massive decrease. Regular diesel fell $37.85, and ultra-low sulfur diesel became $37.09 cheaper per liter. In foreign exchange, the Jamaican dollar weakened last year, closing at $154.95. That's $2.35 more than a year before. The JMD also weakened $7 against the Canadian dollar and $15 against the British pound. 
the euro closed 2023 at $173.14, almost 10 more than the year before. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin prices rebounded in 2023, climbing 162% throughout the year. It was also a good year for Ethereum, up 82% in 2023. Market Recap was brought to you by MyMoneyJA.com This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts is brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Disclaimer, this is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Welcome back. Our analyst panel has been on the money all year round, but I'm curious, what stood out to them the most in 2023? And what are their hot picks for 2024? Let's check in. One of the highlights for me in 2023 was that significantly fewer companies mentioned COVID-19 in their annual and quarterly briefings. The COVID restrictions weren't completely removed in most places until the second half of 2022. So naturally, during that year, companies were still operating within that context. However, as 2023 rolled around, companies were able to operate with the usual freedom that they were used to in the pre-COVID times and we started to see the ease in restrictions flow through the financial statements, as well as the narratives around the numbers being reported, with fewer companies linking poor results to COVID. There was also the fact that NCB, which is the second largest listed company based on market capitalization, finally declared and paid dividends after a relatively long period. The company also reiterated its commitment to consistently pay dividends going forward, which is significant for the entity as certain sections of the market were of the view that the non-payment of the dividends played a role in the decline of the share price. Now looking towards 2024, there is a good possibility that rates could move lower and within such a context, there are several companies which were bullish on going into the new year. Wasinko and Kingston Wharves are two such companies as they are fundamentally strong and they have both detailed significant expansion plans going into the new year. There is also Cygnus Real Estate Finance, which would have just about completed its second major project, which will deliver significant value for shareholders. And this is while the company is trading at a significant discount. However, you asked for a top pick, and for us that has to be Scotiabank. The group recently reported net profits of $17.2 billion for financial year 2023, representing an increase of 67% over the previous year, in a performance anchored by growth across all its business lines. Looking ahead, Scotia is well positioned to continue accelerating new business origination, as well as taking advantage of growth opportunities and making further investments in its core operations to enhance shareholder return. Now, as we enter a new year full of new opportunities, we at JNFM remain ready and capable to provide guidance and support for you to build and achieve your financial vision for the future. Come talk with us or visit our website for more information. I wish you all a wonderful 2024. Happy New Year! I hope that 2024 will be a rewarding and productive year for you guys. All right, so let's jump into the equities review for 2023. We all know that the equities market has been experiencing a downward trend since the onset of COVID. Well, last year was no different. We saw about an 8.5 percentage point drop in the in the market and we saw all the composites being down as well so with all this happening we saw a few bright shining stars in the market we had trans jamaica highway and Wisinko for main market stocks all right so for trans jam we saw they had a standout year last year we saw where investors were willing to forego price appreciation opportunities just to ensure that they had strong dividends strong and consistent dividends coming in in 2024 and beyond 
from Wisinko. They had a good year as well. They did well financially and they were rewarded with a 21% price appreciation in their stocks. So for me, both Trans Jamaica and Wisinko has a lot of potential in terms of long-term prospect and they represent good value for investors who are looking for medium to long-term investment opportunities. In the junior market, we also had two standout firms as well, Main Event and Lasco Distributors and Manufacturing. So let's look at Main Event. Main Event showed strong improvement in its results and one would say this is due to their acceleration in the events planning, you know, lockdown stops so persons are out on a boat and enjoying themselves. So this helped main event a lot. Um, Lasco Manufacturing and Distribution, it continued its performance well in terms of fundamentally and that has transformed into or translated into higher stock prices for 2023. For the year ahead, I will have to agree with Mrs. Street Forest when she said that the equities market for 2024 will be a soft one. With interest rates being as high as they are, if they continue like this, then persons are going to be investing more in fixed income securities. Locally, there's the BOJ 30-day CD, the GOJ T-bill, which is 9180, and to some extent, 270 days. So if these instruments remain high persons will continue to invest in these instruments and the stock market will lag behind in terms of its performance for companies on the exchange we expect that you know their balance sheet will take a hit in terms of the companies that do have debt because they will need to refinance their debt and they will be refinancing at a higher cost than they currently have on their books. So that will affect their financials. And by extension, it will affect how investors view these companies in the market. So we have to keep this in mind that, you know, we're going to see these things continue until the Fed and the BOJ look to lower rate. Then as interest rate gets lower or trend lower, the equities market will start to pick up. Bear in mind, that there will be a lag. We're looking at maybe a six to nine months lag for the equities market to pick up if these banks do start reducing their interest rates. Again, have a productive and rewarding 2024. Highlight for me was the Fed action. The fact that the Fed paused for five months is significant. I don't believe that we're starting a cutting cycle. But a pause phase could drive asset prices much higher for the next couple of months because the market would have been taking some relief from the fact that the hiking cycle would either be de-escalated or stopped altogether. I believe that inflation is still a risk because of the issues in the Panama Canal and, of course, along the corridor of the Red Sea. Those things are inflationary. So we need to keep a close eye on inflation. We need to also factor in that a similar banking crisis could happen in 2024, given that the system is fragile. So that's a part of why I'm bullish on Coca-Cola to begin with, because regardless of the path of the economy, a company like that should still be able to perform in line with or outperform previous year's earnings. My stock for 2024 is Coca-Cola Inc. Company has high quality earnings, a dividend yield above 3%, and it has a beta below 0 0.6, which means that the volatility is lower compared to the market risk, which is one. So it's 40% less volatile than the market. The return on equity is 41% and the dividend yield is, as I mentioned before, very attractive. It's down 9.3% from the 52 week high and the company actually owns more than 16% of Monster Energy Drink. It has significant relationships with fast food suppliers various strategic partnerships. It has an active share buyback program, which means that management is taking supply of the shares off the market, which means that it should increase the upside of the stock. On the US side with um, Ray Dalio, so a lot of us know who Ray Dalio is. Um, 
very successful investor and he used to be the chairman and co-chief investment officer at Bridgewater, so one of the largest um, hedge funds in the world. So he is no longer in that position as a chairman and co-chief investment officer. However, persons still watch that hedge fund very closely to see what they're doing. And in the most recent um, 13F investor filing, which shows you the holdings of the, the different investments they have in their fund, the top nine that they're having now are Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Costco, Pepsi, Walmart, the S&P 500, ETF, and Johnson & Johnson. So I, I thought it very interesting because when you look at all of those companies, you see that the, the fund is taking a very defensive stance, for want of a better word. And that's interesting to see because right now what's in place is a lot of tech, a lot of growth, you know, Microsoft being at all time highs. That's really what's driving. So when you see a really large hedge fund that is starting to become a little defensive, it makes me wonder, like, you know, is something coming? What will 2024 really hold? And for many investors, you may be thinking about what the investment strategy is going to be for 2024, or yeah, it should be. Um, as you're thinking about that, you want to think about the balance. When we see large hedge funds being defensive, but the overall market still supporting tech and growth, which side do you want to be on? Do you want to look a bit at each? Do you want one over the other? It's just some food for thought as you start thinking about what you want to do with your money and the investments for 2024. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much to our analyst panel. But let me know what do you think of their top picks and what are your picks for the year? Let me know in the comments below. We're going to take our final break of the night and come back with more. Stay with us. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Hi, my name is Ashantia Stewart. I am a business owner, the CEO of Ascendev, a digital marketing brand that assists business owners with growing online. Now, the money mission community that Kalila Reynolds have I would recommend it to each and every business owner because it is an environment where in which you can meet like-minded entrepreneurs where in which if you have challenges in your business, you can go ahead and ask someone who has been there, who has done that. And with the launch of this event today, it was a true testament to how great the community is because individuals showed up, you got to network and you got to be in a place where in which it is not just you alone who has a mindset of growth. You had a place where in which individuals have been through the challenges. You have a place where in which you're getting insights into the industry. So I would recommend everyone to tap into it if you're an entrepreneur, if you're looking for growth, or if you're simply someone who wants to learn more. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's our Taking Stock Year in Review 2023. Thanks for joining us. We definitely look forward to an exciting year ahead in stocks, business, and more. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. Remember to turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see everything when it drops. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray and follow at Money Media JA on Instagram. Remember, these are my only accounts. I don't have any backup accounts. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch listen to the podcast or read the articles now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy so let's make it cool to talk about money i'm kalila reynolds thanks for watching and happy new year let's get this money